Millbrook, do you recall anything from the tape recording that was played in this courtroom when you asked several times whether or not your husband was dead or injured? Yes, ma'am, I do. And in response to one of Mr. Phillips' questions, you indicated that that was the first time that you found out that your husband was seriously injured. Isn't that right? Yes, ma'am. It is to my knowledge. Do you recall having a conversation with a Brent Knox in the Boise City Jail? Vaguely, yes, ma'am. Do you recall the date of that conversation? Well, I think it was sometime in November. Do you recall the substance of that conversation with Mr. Knox? Most of it, yes. Do you recall saying, well, they tried to kill Tony. They told me they wouldn't hurt him? Vaguely, yes, I guess I said something along those lines. So you were aware that Tony was seriously injured when you left the house? No. Why did you make that statement to Mr. Knox? Your Honor, I will object to that question as argumentative. Overruled. Your Honor, I will rephrase it. Mrs. Milbrook, on that date after you were taken into custody in the Boise City Jail, you told Brent Knox that you knew that your husband was either dead or seriously injured. Do you recall making that statement? Yes, ma'am, kind of. You have testified in court today that you did not know whether your husband was dead or seriously injured until later that day when you were interrogated by Deputy Perez. That's when I officially knew his status. That's when you officially knew what, Mrs. Millbrook? That my husband was still alive. Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from Idaho State Hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Millbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence sustained. Your Honor, I am asking if she recalls the statement on the radio. She can answer yes or no. The witness is instructed to answer the question, no, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez sitting in the patrol car with you? I don't really remember what his name was. Was that man in the squad car with you in uniform? No, ma'am, he was not. Was he in civilian clothes? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez telling you that you were under arrest for murder? No, I don't remember that. Your Honor, this assumes a fact that is not yet in evidence. Your Honor, it calls for a yes or no answer. Proceed, Mrs. Delaney. Mrs. Millbrook, do you recall being told by Deputy Perez at your residence after the shooting that you were under arrest? No, ma'am, I wasn't told I was under arrest. You don't recall being told that you were under arrest? No, ma'am, I don't recall that. Mrs. Millbrook, is it your testimony that at that time you broke down and began intermittently crying and screaming at Deputy Perez? What would you do? I was upset. There were policemen all over the place. My hands were handcuffed behind my back. I was forced to lie down on the back seat of the squad car. I was crying. I don't recall making any statements. I did not believe that the gun had discharged. You have indicated in response to some questions presented by Mr. Phillips that you and Britt Knox left the house and went for a drive on this Sunday in question. Yes, ma'am. Could that have been Saturday? No, ma'am, it was Sunday. Are you positive it was Sunday? Yes, I am positive. Do you recall having a conversation with Brent Knox regarding some stocks and securities that your husband Tony planned it to transfer to your name? I recall no such conversation with Brent. You never made that statement? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Cross by defense. Mrs. 
Millbrook, do you recall anything from the tape recording that was played in this courtroom when you asked several times whether or not your husband was dead or injured? Yes, ma'am, I do. And in response to one of Mr. Phillips' questions, you indicated that that was the first time that you found out that your husband was seriously injured. Isn't that right? Yes, ma'am, it is to my knowledge. Do you recall having a conversation with a Brent Knox in the Boise City Jail? Vaguely, yes, ma'am. Do you recall the date of that conversation? Well, I think it was sometime in November. Do you recall the substance of that conversation with Mr. Knox? Most of it, yes. Do you recall saying, well, they tried to kill Tony. They told me they wouldn't hurt him? Vaguely. Yes, I guess I said something along those lines. So you were aware that Tony was seriously injured when you left the house? No. Why did you make that statement to Mr. Knox? Your Honor, I will object to that question as argumentative. Overruled. Your Honor, I will rephrase it. Mrs. Milbrook, on that date after you were taken into custody in the Boise City Jail, you told Brent Knox that you knew that your husband was either dead or seriously injured. And do you recall making that statement? Yes, ma'am, kind of. You have testified in court today that you did not know whether your husband was dead or seriously injured until later that day when you were interrogated by Deputy Perez. That's when I officially knew his status. That's when you officially knew what, Mrs. Milbrook? That my husband was still alive. Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statements saying, thank heaven, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from Idaho State Hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor. It is assuming a fact not yet in evidence sustained. Your Honor, I am asking if she recalls the statement on the radio. She can answer yes or no. Now, the witness is instructed to answer the question, no, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez sitting in the patrol car with you? I don't really remember what his name was. Was that man in the squad car with you in uniform? No, ma'am, he was not. Was he in civilian clothes? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall Deputy Perez telling you that you were under arrest for murder? No, I don't remember that. Your Honor, this assumes a fact that is not yet in evidence. Your Honor, it calls for a yes or no answer. Proceed, Mrs. Delaney. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall being told by Deputy Perez at your residence after the shooting that you were under arrest? No, ma'am. I wasn't told I was under arrest. You don't recall being told that you were under arrest? No, ma'am. I don't recall that. Mrs. Milbrook, is it your testimony that? At that time, you broke down and began intermittently crying and screaming at Deputy Perez. What would you do? I was upset. There were policemen all over the place. My hands were handcuffed behind my back. I was forced to lie down on the back seat of the squad car. I was crying. I don't recall making any statements. I did not believe that the gun had discharged. You have indicated in response to some questions presented by Mr. Phillips that you and Brent Knox left the house and went for a drive on this Sunday in question. Yes, ma'am. Could it have that have been Saturday? No, ma'am, it was Sunday. Are you positive it was Sunday? Yes, I am positive. Do you recall having a conversation with Brent Knox regarding some stocks and securities that your husband, Tony, planned to transfer to your name? I recall no such conversation with Brent. You never made that statement? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. We'll read this one back. Cross by defense. Mrs. Milbrook, do you recall anything from the tape recording that was played in this courtroom when you asked several times whether or not your husband was dead or injured? Yes, ma'am, I do. And in response to one of Mr. Phillips' questions, you indicated that that was the first time that you found out that your husband was seriously injured. Isn't that right? Yes, ma'am, it is to my knowledge. Do you recall having a conversation with a Brent Knox in the Boise City Jail? Vaguely, yes, ma'am. Do you recall the date of that conversation? Well, 
I think it was sometime in November. Do you recall the substance of that conversation with Mr. Knox? Most of it, yes. Do you recall saying, well, they tried to kill Tony. They told me they wouldn't hurt him. Vaguely, yes, I guess I said something along those lines. So you were aware that Tony was seriously injured when you left the house? No. Why did you make that statement to Mr. Knox? Your Honor, I will object to that question as argumentative. Overruled. Your Honor, I will rephrase it. Mrs. Millbrook, on that day after you were taken into custody in the Boise City Jail, you told Britt Knox that you knew that your husband was either dead or seriously injured. Do you recall making that statement? Yes, ma'am, kind of. You have testified in court today that you did not know whether your husband was dead or seriously injured until later that day when you were interrogated by Deputy Perez. That's when I officially knew his status. That's when you officially knew what, Mrs. Millbrook? That my husband was still alive. Actually, isn't it true that before you were removed from the house that night, they told you your husband was seriously injured? I don't remember. Yes or no? I, I don't know. Later at the time you were interrogated, which we have on the tape, you asked if your husband was alive. Is that correct? I think I did. At that time, you made some statement saying, thank heavens, thank the Lord. Yes, that is true. What made you believe Deputy Perez at that time and not earlier at your place of residence? Because someone came in the room, one of the other officers, and he said that he had received a call from Idaho State Hospital that my husband was in intensive care. Mrs. Millbrook, do you recall sitting in a squad car that evening? Yes, ma'am, I do. And do you recall hearing a statement over the radio of that squad car that there was a shotgun victim at 908 Skyview Lane? Well, now, how do you expect me to remember all this? Objection, Your Honor, it is assuming a fact not yet in evidence sustained. Your Honor, I am asking if she recalls the statement on the radio. She can answer yes or no. The witness is instructed to answer the question, no, ma'am. changed. 
If you were to take a minute, could you figure out whether this $13,353 is correct or the $14,353 is correct? I would say the $13,353 is correct because I see it's been corrected on here. So with respect to the loss from mirrors cut, there has been no change between August 15, 1990 and your testimony today in the figure of $6,411.13. That's right, yes ma'am. And the only change in the next item, loss from mirrors sold at 20 cents a foot, is $1,000, which apparently was a mathematical error originally. Is that a correct statement? Yes ma'am. Now then, do you have an extra copy of what you are referring to? Yes, I am looking at the summary of loss. Now, the next figure, loss from sale of reject vanity mirrors on this schedule that you have just handed me, entitled Summary of Loss, shows $26,098.80. On the answers to the interrogatories on August 15, 1990, it says, loss from sale of decorator mirrors. In other words, it doesn't mention vanity mirrors in that one, but are we talking about the same loss there? No, there has been a change in that. Well, I mean from the same type of loss, same type of loss, yes ma'am. What is the change that accounts for the increase from $20,593.68 to $26,098.80? Can you explain that increase? Yes. When we left here on Wednesday with instructions to get some viable figures together, we went back to the Hartford office and we were able to determine from more complete records there that, in fact, surprisingly enough, all of the vanity mirrors had been sold. Had been? Yes, sir. And they had not been sold on August 15, 1990? No, ma'am, I don't think they had been. I didn't have the complete records when I was back in Darien. When these interrogatories came in for answer in August of 1990, were they sent back to Connecticut for you to answer them? I never saw them before. Well, you must have from what you have just said. You prepared this and sent it to Mr. Chamberlain, did you not? I prepared this document in September of 1990. I am sorry, counsel. What are we referring to? Mrs. Delaney, we need a clarification. I am referring to Exhibit A attached to the answers to the interrogatories with a mailing affidavit of August 15, 1990. And that was an answer to interrogatory number 18. Set forth in exact detail of the computation of damages in the amount of $75,583.26 as alleged on page five, line one of your first amended complaint. Thank you, Mrs. Delaney. <coughs> I think so. Does that figure include the $16,098.80 on Schedule C? Yes, sir, it does. Well, then, is $59,669.44 the total loss? Yes, sir. Rather than the $75,000 plus as alleged in your cross complaint? Yes, sir. I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Very well. Mrs. Delaney, Mr. DeSalvo, I am referring now to a document entitled Answers to Interrogatories dated August 15, 1990. This was the loss as originally computed, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I figured that in Darien, Connecticut in about September of 1989, and I figured it from the best available records I had at the time. And although this document was apparently verified by Mr. Chamberlain, it was from information that you had furnished to him. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Now, obviously, there are some changes on it because the figure now, rather than $75,000 plus, it says $59,000 plus. Is that correct? Yes. Now, you correct me as we go along here if I am wrong. As I understand your testimony, the $6,411.13 is still a correct figure? Yes, it is. How about the $14,353.20? Is that still a correct figure? I don't know. I have got $13,353.20, and the last five digits are, six of the seven digits are the same. I don't know whether this is a 13 or 14. It's essentially the same. Can I look at something else here? Yes, something in here? In here. 
I would say that either I made an arithmetic error in that, or uh, there is an arithmetic error here, but the total number of mirrors claimed hasn't changed. If you were to take a minute, could you figure out whether this $13,353 is correct or the $14,353 is correct? I will say the $13,353 is correct because I see it's been corrected on here. So with respect to the loss from years cut, there has been no change between August 15, 1990 and your testimony today in the figure of $6,411.13. That's right. Yes, ma'am. And the only change in the next item, loss from mirrors sold at 20 cents a foot, is $1,000, which apparently was a mathematical error originally. Is that a correct statement? Yes, ma'am. Now then, do you have an extra copy of what you are referring to? Yes, I am looking at the summary of loss. Now the next figure, loss from sale of reject vanity mirrors on this schedule that you have just handed me, entitled Summary of Loss, shows $26,098.80. On the answers to the interrogatories on August 15, 1990, it says loss from sale of decorator mirrors. In other words, it doesn't mention vanity mirrors in that one. But are we talking about the same loss there? No, there has been a change in that. Well, I mean the same type of loss? Same type of loss, yes ma'am. What is the change that accounts for the increase from $20,593.68 to $26,098.80? Can you explain that increase? Yes. When we left here on Wednesday with instructions to get some viable figures together, we went back to the Hartford office and we were able to determine from more complete records there that, in fact, surprisingly enough, all of the vanity mirrors had been sold. Had been? Yes, ma'am. And they had not been sold on August 15, 1990? No, ma'am. I don't think they had been. I didn't have the complete records when I was back in Darien. When these interrogatories came in for answer in August of 1990, were they sent back to Connecticut for you to answer them? I never saw them before. Well, you must have from what you have just said. You prepared this and sent it to Mr. Chamberlain, did you not? I prepared this document in September of 1990. I am sorry, counsel. What are we referring to? Mrs. Delaney, we need a clarification. I am referring to Exhibit A, attached to the answers to the interrogatories with a mailing affidavit of August 15, 1990. And that was an answer to interrogatory number 18. Set forth in exact detail the computation of damages in the amount of $75,583.26 as alleged on page five, line one of your first amended complaint. Thank you, Mrs. Delaney. Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A. <clears throat> okay, and they keep talking about a cleaver, C L E A V E R. <laughs> okay. Sounds good, huh? downstairs yes now how did that happen when I went downstairs he said he said I have to pay him for the time he spent on me and I said I am wasting my time too why should I pay you so he started to hit me on my head where were you when he was sitting you on the head I was sitting on the sofa now is that downstairs yes the family room now after he started hitting you on the head what happened then he started to choke me. And then what happened? My mother saw it from the kitchen. My mother was preparing her tea. She was in the kitchen when this was happening? Yeah. Where was Melissa when this was happening? Melissa? Melissa walked upstairs. And my mom came over and she saw that he was choking me. And what did she do? She wanted to pull him away, but she fell. And then what happened? And then he said, I'm going to get a cleaver to kill both of you. Who said that? Defendant. He said that to you? My husband, he said it loud, uh-huh. And when he said that, what did you do? And I saw him walk in the kitchen, and I told my mom, hurry up and run upstairs. 
What were you thinking at that time? He was going to get a cleaver to kill us. Was there a cleaver in the kitchen? Yes. Did you see the cleaver that night during dinner? During dinner, no. Do you keep, is there a cleaver that is kept in your kitchen? Yes. And do you know if that cleaver was used to prepare the dinner that night? Yes. It was used, it was used. Can you describe how that cleaver looks? It was real big. You use it to cut meat. Did it have a handle on it? Yes, a wood handle. For the record, Your Honor, she has demonstrated with her finger, but she kept moving them so we don't know. How big would you say? Show us again just with your finger about this big. With her finger, she is outlining an imaginary rectangle about, oh boy, I don't know. And Your Honor, I would interpose an objection. On the grounds, the object would be the best evidence and, yes, we will overrule the objection. Now, the object certainly would be evidence, but not necessarily the best evidence. Probably would be, but other evidence is sufficient. I am looking at a ruler to compare it with her. I am not good at inches, but something probably like approximately six inches. A rectangle, six inches by about four inches, maybe three inches by five inches, but that is the dimensions of the blade. Is uh, that the blade of the cleaver? Yes, all right. She is attempting to describe. And then protruding out from the blade, there was a wooden handle attached, yes. So the entire length of the cleaver would be longer than the six inches that the judge described, yes. Now, after he said he was going to kill both of you, did you attempt to leave the dining room? Yes. And were you alone with your mother, with my mother, and what did the two of you do at that point? We ran. We ran away. Where did you run? Upstairs. And when you were running upstairs, where was the defendant? He was in the kitchen. He ran to, he ran to the kitchen. Is that where the cleaver was kept at that time? Yes, all that time. Now, when you got to the stairs, did you go up the stairs? Yes. And how did you go up the stairs? I ran upstairs. Was your mother going up the stairs at the same time? My mom was running behind me. You were both running up the stairs? Uh-huh. And then what happened as you ran up the stairs? And I saw my mom tripped on the landing, so I turned around and I wanted to pick her up. Now, was that at the top of the stairs or the bottom of the stairs or in the middle of the stairs? The top. She fell at the top of the stairs? Right. And when she fell, what happened? I wanted to pick her up and then I saw my I saw the cleaver and my arm was stuck, my right arm. Your mother fell down at the top of the stairs, is that right? Right. Did you attempt to help her? Yes. Now, when you were helping her, did you bend it down? Yes. And when you were bending down, where were your arms? Right next to my mom. Was she my mom's right side? My mom was laying down on the ground on the floor. Was she making any sounds at that time? She said, my God, it is too late. We are not going to make it. Your mother said that? Uh -huh.